I'd like to introduce our host uh, for this evening, who will lead us through tonight's conversation and introduce our guests. Uh, Karen B.K. Chan is an award-winning sex and emotional literacy educator in Toronto with more than 20 years of experience. Uh, trained in creative facilitation, productive thinking, and nonviolent communication, Chan is dedicated to having difficult conversations that are real, transformative, and kind. Whatever the context, Chan finds herself telling stories about being a young and queer newcomer to Canada in the 80s. So please help me welcome to the stage, uh, BK. Hi, how are you? I mean it, how are you? Good, you look great. So tonight we are here with three kick-ass filmmakers, and I cannot wait to talk to them. I hope it's okay that I swear. Um, to talk to them, um, we're going to talk about as many things as we can in the short time that we have together, so I won't waste a lot of time talking right now. We're going to talk about things like representation and storytelling and authenticity and truths. We're going to talk about, hopefully, food and identity and other serious things. Um, so... Let's talk about them. These are the folks who will be with us tonight. I'm gonna to read their bios for you. And please just shout if I read anything wrong. Tiffany Shong. Tiffany Shong is a award-winning filmmaker based in Toronto. Her debut feature length documentary, The Apology, which is what uh, you'll see a piece of tonight, has won over a dozen international awards at festivals like Hot Docs, Busan, and Oslo. The film earned Sheng a nomination for the Alan King Award for Excellence in Documentary from the Directors Guild of Canada. Her 2017 film, The Space We Hold, won a Peabody Facebook Futures of Media Award for Best Interactive Documentary and a Canadian Screen Award for Best Original Interactive Production. Domi Shi was born in Chongqing, China and grew up in Toronto. After she graduated from the animation program at Sheridan College, shout out Sheridan College, she began working at Pixar Animation Studios, first as a story intern and then as a story artist. Her credits include the Academy Award winning Inside Out, The Good Dinosaur, Incredibles 2, and the upcoming Toy Story 4. She wrote and directed the short film, Bao, which you will see tonight in its entirety. And it sounds like you're gonna see it again, because you've seen it already. <laughs> Joyce Wong. Joyce is an award-winning director and writer. She is an, an alumna of the 2008 Berlinale Talent Campus and of the 2016 TIFF Talent Lab right here. Her debut narrative feature, Wexford Plaza, which you'll see also a piece of tonight, screened at Slam Dance in 2017 and received the Comcast Best Narrative Feature Award from the Center for Asian American Media in San Francisco. The film was also nominated for the Toronto Film Critics Association's Rogers Best Canadian Film Award and the Canadian Screen Awards John Dunning Discovery Award. So I will pause there so that we can see um, these pieces of the, their creations, and then we'll get together for a conversation. Hi. Thanks for coming. So many people here. Oh. I'm so overwhelmed by um, the the stories being told by the candor, by the truth. Um, I kind of wish to just stay in the dark and just like feel some things. Um, but we're here, so let's chat. But before we chat, I actually am curious who you are who's um, helping us have this conversation tonight. So can we see a, a show of hands? How many people here are filmmakers? Cool, we see you. Um, writers? Awesome. Animators? Yeah. Students of any kind? I guess students of life, all of us, but <laughs> students, awesome. Um, how about um, parents and family of these beautiful creators? 
um, like the LA Times called your parents the creators of the creators. <laughs> How many? Hello. Thank you. Great job. All right, so we're going to start the panel um, with a lightning round so that we're not just getting all serious immediately. Um, okay, you ready? Yeah. Okay. So firstly, a three-word review of Crazy Rich Asians, if you've seen it. <laughs> Have you seen it? Yeah. Okay, three-word review from each of you. Uh, tacky, fun, uh, diamonds? I don't know. <laughs> Constance Wu is the bomb. <laughs> Crazy, rich, Asians. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, second question. Finish this sentence. If you work with me, you would know that I... If you work with me, you'd know that I... Love noodles. I <laughs> make films. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Sorry, I don't like talking about myself. Uh, I make a lot of food puns. As you work. As I work. Beautiful. Great group of people here. All right. <laughs> I'm not even joking. Okay, ready? Favorite kind of dumpling of any cultural okay. background, okay. source, or content? Favorite dumpling? Boiled dumplings, pork and leek. Beautiful, thank you. Pork and cabbage, pan fried. <laughs> I'll have to say, I don't know if this is in the category, but I would say Shaolong Bao in Taiwan, 1940s styles. <laughs> I'm you really can, serious about it. You can my... throw your mic away now. Okay, <laughs> beautiful. And this one borders on being um, more serious. What are the words you would use to describe yourself? Like if the census had unlimited words on it and you had to check off boxes. I mean, we're here under the giant words of Asian Canadian. Are those words that you use to describe yourself? What are some other words? This is hard. Sorry, this is hard. <laughs> it's like a test. Should have taken <laughs> improv. I know. Uh, um, Chinese, uh, foodie, uh, uh, animator. Uh, uh, <laughs> those, those are good. Can we have some encouragement? <laughs> yeah. I'm also a weightlifter. Ooh. Right on. Previously powerlifting, but transitioning to Olympic. It's, it's, well, you. not competing in the Olympics, because I'm not like 18. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it's like a style of, of weightlifting. Beautiful. Wow. Any other words? Um, lifetime learner. Um, foodie as well, or eater, really. Just want to eat. <laughs> I wish we were eating right now. <laughs> um, carpenter, or wish to be a carpenter. Yeah, you guys have so many skills. I pretend, like, it's not like I actually ever built anything that I could live, but, you know, I, I, I want to. I aspire to be a carpenter. Beautiful. Thank you. So just so you know who these folks are, this is Domi, this is Joyce, and this is Tiffany. So I want to know for each of the projects that we just saw, how did um, the project start? How did it come about? How was it that you became the teller of that story? Anyone? Oh, I guess I'll start. Oh. Uh, so I um, came up with the idea for Bao uh, over four years ago in my office at Pixar. Um, I was like working late one night. I think I was really hungry, probably. Um, and I had been working as a storyboard artist on uh, Inside Out for about two years, but I really wanted to um, just make something creative on my own, on the side. Uh, and so I started brainstorming ideas and Bao kind of came into fruition. Uh, and then 
about a year later, so I was working on it kind of on and off just as a side project, but a year later, um, Pixar kind of did this open, almost like an addition at the, at the studio where they asked anyone at the studio um, to pitch three ideas each for the next short film. And it was kind of like American Idol or Canadian Idol, but like I like signed up and I was like one of 50 or so uh, employees. Uh, and then the, you, you have to like go in there and you have your ideas kind of pinned onto pin boards and you have five minutes to talk about each of the, of the ideas. And there's like a panel of judges. It's like directors, executives, producers. There's like multiple rounds. Uh, it was terrifying, but you know, I, I made it through and uh, I ended up, uh, like Bao ended up getting uh, picked as the next official Pixar theatrical short. Uh, and that was in 2015, so my side project became like my legit main project then, so yeah. Awesome, thank crazy. you for entering that contest. Yeah, that gladiator yeah. battle. Yeah. No, it wasn't really a battle. <laughs> Sounds stressful though. It, 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 it is anxiety <laughs> inducing. Um, so I was driving to Scarborough um, to visit my grandma. Woo! Sc Scarborough! And um, I was passing by all these strip malls that were getting torn down and turned into um, like big box stores. And so that kind of just hit me a bit because I was like, oh, like I feel like a sense of nostalgia for these like really like worn down strip malls that used to be like the, the beacon of the American dream <laughs> that that's that still kind of have like a bit of that architecture, that hopeful architecture, and and I was like, oh, I, I kind of want to like preserve this somehow, this kind of feeling, and um, and I was like, oh, like I don't think I should make coffee table books, but um, <laughs> like like may, maybe I I can you know make a film about it because like I'm I'm a filmmaker, and so um, so then um, another th like thing that I remembered was back when I was in high school a close friend of mine was a security guard and she would tell me the most ridiculous stories. And so these two things kind of just like microwaved in my brain. And, and then the, the, I guess the starting point of Wexford Plaza began. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, so the apology started um, back long time ago when I first met the grandmothers. Um, I met them in 2009. And when I first met them, I was actually on a study tour documenting educators, and I would hear them testify in these, uh, in these sterile rooms, and they would just you know, recount these traumatic, horrific um, experiences that they, that they went through. And after that, they would leave the room, and that was it, that you wouldn't actually know anything more about them. And so it was after that trip, um, I came back to Toronto, and I shared the stories with many people in Toronto. And it was to also my surprise that they also didn't know much about this history as well. Like, I had first learned about this during that trip, and I was shocked. And the fact that you know, many other people also didn't know about their stories. And I wanted to, I wanted to learn more about what had happened, but also more importantly, how did they go through six decades after the war? And to really understand, you know, um, the impact is to really understand, to actually understand the aftermath. And so, <laughs> that was a laser gun there. <laughs> And so after meeting the grandmothers um, on that initial trip and spending more time with them and actually getting to know their families and their communities, um, I really wanted to make a film that was really highlighting who they are as people first and to really showcase their human spirit and what they were going through today in their families. And um, who you saw in the clip right now, we showed you the trailer, but we also, the clip that I showed you is Grandma Chow. Um, and in the village where she lives with her daughter. And just an example was that I really wanted people to understand the family dynamics of what the grandmothers had gone through over all of these years that we actually don't ever get to talk about and to learn about that really contributes to the shame and to the silence. And really allowing us to understand the, the strength of these women was to also follow them and to document someone like Grandma Chow who travels around the world. I, I was in awe with her when I first met her. And so when we made the apology, it was really a big point for us was to, to showcase that they're resilient and their strength, and, and very much to see that, you know, their stories resonate uh, universally today with everything that's going on today as well. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks, Tiffany. I could talk to like each of you for about a week. So I'm going to go right into creative process and wanting to know some of the the nitty gritty of what you went through to create each of your projects, um, each of your films. Um, and specifically, I'm wondering if you can remember or if you talk about um, tough decisions that you had to make in this project. Um, what were some of those tough decisions that come to mind and what decision did you end up making and how did you make it? whole process is pretty tough. Um, like starting from getting that idea out of your brain onto a coherent um, form that people can understand on a paper, then getting financing, and then, um, and then all the labor to actually get the piece done. Um, so I think just like, it, it's kind of a, a bit of a, uh, a struggle to, to kind of get that work work made. Um, like, like I, I feel like, but for me, like I feel like casting was was pretty difficult to kind of find the right cast mm -hmm. for um, my film because I really wanted, um, especially Betty's character, to have a vulnerability but also an agency, and so it took us a really long time to. Um, to find her. We, we actually um, found her through an old prof of mine who sent me an email um, about um, this, this woman that she saw in a student film like a decade ago. And it turned, turns out that she, um, this, this woman was living in Kingston and she was grooming dogs for a living and, um, and she had left like the filmmaking industry. And, and, and so, so anyhow, we reached out to her and then we convinced her to be in the film. And so so that was like that was pretty like difficult, um, yeah. And so I think I think that was a, a like a hard a hard thing to find. I think. And she's amazing. So yeah. good job on that one. <laughs> um, for me, uh, one of the more challenging parts of making this short was. Um, executing the style that I wanted uh, to to convey like in like for the short um, because uh, there's this whole kind of process at Pixar where they over years have become really good at making um, movies but like looking a certain way and uh, when my original vision for this short was I really wanted it to have that handmade um, almost like a stop-motion quality to it. Um, I didn't want everything to look super realistic, super rendered. I wanted um, the world to feel soft and round like a, like a dumpling world. Um, <laughs> but it was really difficult because the default for a lot of our software at the studio is like hyper-realistic, like, like pores on the face. And um, it was just, uh, it, I, I owe it to like our art team, um, and just the collaboration between art and technology and how we were able to just uh, simplify uh, the designs down and just simplify the shading down um, to like a look that looks very appealing but not like uh, cheap looking. It looks very rich but simple. Um, and that was really challenging to do. Thank you. So I, th I think um, one of the greatest uh, creative challenge and process we had about over 400 hours of footage to work with. Um, and I have to say, I mean, like we all know, you know, a film isn't made by one person. It really takes a village to, to make a film. And I was very blessed and I had a great opportunity to work with the National Film Board and to have amazing, amazing filmmakers and, you know, incredible pioneer filmmakers, strong women filmmakers really at the helm of this, you know, one being here, Anita Lee, um, Mary Stephen, our editor, Leslie Barber. We had incredible, huge, huge team to make this film come alive. And one of the greatest challenge was um, making a decision. I think we were at like maybe, a, I wanna say a rough cut around like, first of all, our director's assembly, which is kind of a joke now, it was like 18 hours long. <laughs> and at one point I'm like, why can't this movie be 10 hours? Um, but when we were finally at two and a half hours, I was like, okay. 
maybe we could have a two and a half hour film. Um, there was still a very important question that um, had to kind of be answered was whether or not I was going to be a character in the film because so much of this footage, I was in it. And I actually had a very you know, deep relationship with the grandmothers that you see that I'm actually physically in it and having these conversations. So for, for the most part, I, it was always like, am I in it? Am I not in it? And, and that's why I'm very grateful that I had a very strong team with me that I trusted, that I knew had my back to allow me to have, go through that process to come to that conclusion, really, that it was whether or not you know, we had the footage, we had the strong footage and an amazing, amazing, um, you know, storylines. And, and we basically had enough so that I didn't need to be in it. And it was, it was the hardest decision because I had to separate myself from what I had experienced in the, making the documentary and what the audience was going to experience, and it was many conversations with Anita, with Mary, with you know our, our team, really to to say, hey, your choice is this. It's very simple. It's your audience could either experience the grandmother through you as a vessel, or they can experience it directly, just them. And that choice was very clear. The moment when that was was brought to the table, it was like definitely want them to experience it directly with the grandmothers. And um, I'm just so happy that you know we came to that and that I had the team and support to really help me get to that conclusion and to, to make this film the way it is today. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you, I'm imagining all of you being at the, the helm also of, of your each of your films. Um, and it's not often that I see um, our people, my people, um, Asian women at the helm of such things. Um, so I'm curious as to how that identity, how you're perceived, which is pretty separate also from how you are and how you self-perceive, um, affects your work. So my question is actually, how do you relate to the ideas about you? How do you relate to the ideas about you? I had written it down you know, more eloquently. It goes something like, um, the, the Chimamanda um, quote goes something like, the problem with stereotypes is not that they're untrue, it's that they're incomplete. So, how do you relate to these stereotypes that may or may not exist in the circles that you travel in? And how, do you, how does your work relate to those stereotypes? I think stereotypes are unidimensional caricatures of, um, of groups of people that inherently have um, a lot of diversity and dimension to them. And I th so I think that stereotypes are very destructive. I think one, because this kind of cognitive shortcut, this, um, these like very kind of surface portrayals um, weaken our ability for critical thought. And also um, it propagates misinformation. But the second thing, I think it, it, it I feel like it, it also, because, like it, people also use stereotypes um, for destructive means, like for example, the idea of model minorities, right? And so does everyone like kind of generally know what that the term, the model minority myth is in this room? So like that, you know, idea has been used to like denigrate the struggles um, against racism of other people of color, um, especially in America, especially with black Americans, right? You know? This idea that, oh, the reason why we've succeeded or we have been perceived to succeed is because of our docile nature and our hardworking culture. Um, therefore, anyone could succeed, right? But you know, it's, it's quite different when you've experienced two centuries of slavery and you're systematically dehumanized every day, right? So, so, it, so stereotypes, like in that kind of case, like is a very, very destructive tool so so I, I, I don't I don't think I necessarily agree that stereotypes 
have an element of truth to them. I feel like they're just fundamentally false. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, uh, I have like a complicated, uh, I guess, relationship with stereotypes because being an animator, um, a lot of like my job or just like being an artist, like a kind of um, uh, like our job is kind of just to caricature the world around us, to uh, use drawings, to use art as like a, a symbol for the things that we see around us. And our um, like uh, our our job is to like simplify and break things down to like an understandable level, so like lots of people can understand it. And so um, for me, it's always been tricky because uh, it's like oh like I. Like I really love caricature. I really love like the art of um, of cartoons. But then at the same time, like you know, like like Joy said, like stereotypes are just so harmful. Like um, on, uh, like just in the big picture, um, on on Bao, that was like something that we uh, had to kind of um, kind of just deal with a bit was uh, my like my vision for the designs of the characters. Um, uh, I had this very specific design for uh, the mom character because uh, I kind of modeled her after how I caricature myself uh, on my Instagram, which is like a bean shaped head, little like line eyes and like two hippo nostrils and a mouth. Um, and I always thought that was really cute. And uh, it was kind of my way to kind of like uh, take back, uh, you know, like the the slanty-eyed like stereotype of a lot of uh, Asian uh, people, because um, I was made fun of, it, uh, of of that a lot growing up, and now I've kind of just embraced it and kind of uh, accepted it as like a, a cute feature of mine that I actually am proud of. Um, but then that like was something that was really tricky because that doesn't uh, automatically translate when you put it on screen and you show people without context. <laughs> so that was just uh, something that we had to be really um, sensitive to. Uh, and then uh, we did a lot of research. I mean, I it was important for me to get a production designer um, who was uh, Chinese American herself, who has that experience, who I knew and who I could trust uh, to like uh, lead the design of the characters and of the world in like a truthful, authentic way, um, while also kind of uh, simplifying it and making it colorful and fun. Um, but it was it was tricky. And and yeah, I, th I think we succeeded. I think we succeeded. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Um, it's funny because we were talking about math back in the green room, oh, yeah. and I was just like, well, you know, I failed grade ten math. Um, people often think I would be naturally slightly better at math. <laughs> Sorry, mom. It's such a disappointment right now because she's like, I I did better. I did better. <laughs> um, in many ways, I feel like that was kind of been the heartbeat of some of the things that I do in film and storytelling is to break away some of the stereotypes. Like hanging out with the grandmothers, people might assume that grandmothers, whatever, whichever culture, cultural background, grandmothers are soft-spoken, quiet, timid. No, they are fierce, independent, filled with so much wisdom. Like the clip that you see with Grandma Chow, you see her, she's like, no, 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 don't help me. I could wash my own hands. I don't need help getting up. Like if I had gotten to go to school, I would have been able to read. Like she is so fierce, you know, and our other grandmothers as well. And so for me, it was like a lot of the things that I really wanted to do was to be able to show these other sides of these grandmothers that, that often is not seen, you know, and and also when we talk about culture, also like to also break away some of the the ideas of what love looks like, you know, love comes in so many different shapes and form. Here in North America, it looks at like a particular way where, you know, my friend's family, like my you know Canadian friend's family, they would often say love a lot and touch each other a lot, and 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 you know what, love is expressed in so many different ways and culturally, like, and that's why I want to show that clip specifically, like. Her daughter loves her mother. It's just expressed through a lot of screaming and through. <laughs> well, let's let's be honest. There's a lot of screaming that happens, and and um, and food. Food is the expression of love, and I saw that in Bao as well. But you see, you know, her daughter is making her, you know, 
um, a bing and is delivering it to her mom and yes, screaming at her for falling, but there's, there's love in all of the actions is what I'm saying. And I think it's important when we talk about stereotypes and we also talk about just like representation of like, you know, one thing, one way. I think there's different ways of looking at things and, um, and it goes across the board. Um, but yeah, I've, I feel like sometimes when I, I do check myself if like I am in a different group, a new group, and I am the, a quiet person in that group and I'm not saying anything. And I do think in the back of my head, oh, I'm, they probably just expect that of me of being timid and docile and submissive. And, and I, they just don't know. I'm just like processing and listening and gathering as much information because I'm actually really loud as fuck. Like I am <laughs> fiercely loud, I'm just gathering. So it's, it's interesting, I, I always do, I do catch myself wanting to counteract mm -hmm. some of those stereotypes and and maybe in some ways that has made me into who I am today and uh, just living with that now. <laughs> yeah, I can really relate to that and sometimes I wonder, so it's just as much hold maybe on me as a stereotype, which is that I live to um, counter a stereotype. Um, which is why I love all the stories you tell so much, because they're complicated, they're really complex, and I think that is what liberates um, us from the stereotypes, is that, you know, telling the story of desolation in Scarborough strip malls, it, it's, it can be, re it can be simplified, it can become so simplistic, and yet you made it beautiful and complicated, um, and, and that's, I'm, I'm interested in that, that way that you have all um, made decisions. Um, I'm also wanting to know the time we have. We have seven minutes, great. Um, I'm curious if you want to ask each other anything. If you do, please do. If not, I have more questions for you. <laughs> yeah, and you get to ask questions too. In, in seven minutes, it's your turn. Um, I, May I continue, or do you want to oh, say? I was going to ask Tiffany if you are still in contact with the grandmas, or have they all passed on? Or <laughs> and it's kind of a that's kind of a downer question. I, I wow, it's I like get that. right in there, right? Eh? Oh, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, um, no, sorry. it's. I, I wanted to mention actually, Grandma Chow. I also wanted to show her clip because I had just found out recently that she passed away. Oh, um, she was uh, 95 years old. Damn. That's um, and uh, a Grandma Adela had also passed away while we were filming. Oh. And right now, Grandma Gill is the only one that's alive in it that was from our film. Um, and she's her dementia is very strong right now. And um, I was told, because I, di I did keep in touch with Grandma Chow after filming. We actually brought the film to her to screen it with her, her daughter, and her granddaughter with my mother. So my mother came with me to the village and she was translating to them the entire film and it was really a special reunion. And since then I've been going back to the village to spend more time. And it's like so stress-free because there's no camera and we could just hang out and eat, eat and smoke, smoke and eat, eat. <laughs> like all of that, you know? And, and really part of that, that relationship with the grandmothers was all around food. And I was gonna actually ask you this question was whether or not, while you were making the film, were you guys always eating dumplings? Oh, yes. We had like you so many research, tr research trips, <laughs> research trips um, um, to uh, Chinese restaurants. Oh my gosh, um, we, you are living my dream. Yeah, I, it, it, was, it was awesome. We had like f dumpling photo shoots. It got weird. Like <laughs> we were like filming like a dumpling, like 360 and like, I was like, yeah, poke it. Poke it. I want to see the like the 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 elasticity of the of the wrapper. Like throw it on the floor. I want to see how it breaks. It wow. Got weird. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you for your research. Um, <laughs> actually, we really benefited from it. I, I was marveling at the textures. Um, so I'm curious because I want to see a lot more of all of your work. Um, what is it that it, the next challenge, not necessarily the next project, but what is um, challenging up ahead and how are you going to meet it like a badass that you are? Um, currently working uh, in development on my own feature film at Pixar. Uh, which is pretty exciting. 
Uh, yeah. and, I'm, and I'm terrified. I'm just taking it one day at a time. I'm trying not to freak out about it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm also working on my next feature right now, another narrative film. It's, it'll be too long to kind of explain right now. Um, so, but I'm kind of in this like perfection paralysis kind of. <laughs> so I have like the first draft, like it's been like in on my computer for the last couple of months. But I'm just like, oh, but I want to fix this little thing, this little thing. And and every Friday I'm like, I'll send it to my agent. But but I'm like, oh no no no, I'll wait till Monday and I'll, I'll fix this little thing. So so I need to get out of my head and and um, send it out. <laughs> Thank you. Please do. Um, two big challenges right now. I think one for the last couple of years, really um, wanting to, and I wanted to actually t say this in a room uh, like this, was to actually, you know, really deal with mental health issues and to really talk about that. I think that's really important as artists, as creators, and, you know, it's, it's very hard work, uh, you know, telling stories. And I think that that's something that I really wanted to um, put at the forefront and not ignore and sweep underneath the rug. Um, but uh, the next project is actually a project that's very personal uh, that dates back to 13, 14 years ago, finding my own grandmother, my biological grandmother. So uh, that's going to be a, an interesting journey that I'm sure will also be very, very difficult too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think if you're terrified, um, that's usually to me the sign that you're doing the challenging thing. Is that right? Um, okay, so we're going to skip right into having questions come from you. We have mics coming to you. Say anything you want to, please feel free. Hi. Um, Tiffany, you mentioned, this is a question for everyone, but Tiffany mentioned um, a, a love of learning. And I wanted to hear a little bit more about that from each of you, about what you learned about your creative voice and how your creative voice developed and changed throughout the projects that you just showed us, as well as like what you learned personally about your life through doing these works. Go, Joyce, go. <laughs> OK, OK. Uh, the pressure's on, the pressure's on. Um, I think what's amazing about filmmaking is the more you learn, the more immense the craft is. So when I was in film school, I, had a, I, felt, I feel like I had a very narrow understanding of what making a film was. It was kind of like you know, telling the story in a coherent way and you know, making sure technically um, you know, everything worked and whatever, right? Um, but I find that as I watch more films from like after making my first feature from Masters and seeing kind of the precision of the craft and how efficient they are with their screen time, it just, it just, it, it's like standing next to a mountain. It's like being in Banff and standing um, like next to those huge mountains. It's, it's kind of terrifying, but also super inspiring at the same time, because I feel like I could keep on doing this until I die, and I'll still never perfect it, but maybe I can, you know, get close to, um, you know, like, like, the, like what any of the, the masters, like, like, a, like Ozu, for example, right? So, so I, I think it's like this like love, this terrifying love of the craft. Man, that's, that's totally true. Um, uh, for me, I think I really learned uh, to embrace my weirdness uh, as I was making this, uh, this short, but also through my, uh, my career thus far, um, just at Pixar, just as a, as a filmmaker and a, and a story artist. I think uh, um, I've really just embraced that part of myself. And even when I was first pitching Bao, uh, I was hesitant at first because I didn't know if uh, Pixar would ever go for something this like weird with such a dark twist ending. I even chickened out at some point, and the the whole American Idol 
audition thing. Like I had pitched a watered down version of it. Like I I th- I thought Disney would never go for something like that. But um, luckily, uh, I had like a like a guardian angel, like advocate in the in the judging panel, Pete Doctor, who I pitched um, the original version to like some time ago. And he stood up and he was like, that's not the version you pitched me. <laughs> Pitch them the original version. It was so cool. Uh, and I think because he really believed in me and just that helped me build my confidence and just really embrace that, uh, that, that weirdness uh, in, in my voice and my style. And, and now I'm, I'm like really proud of it. It's, it's the only thing I have. <laughs> that's all I got, man. <laughs> Um, I say that I'm a lifetime learner because I'm. I realize while making the apology, like you have to understand, I when I started out, I was um, a really. I felt like I was very um, overly confident and felt like I knew everything, which was like totally not the case. And within like the first year, I kind of like smacked around, like thinking, actually, you're still learning, Tiffany. And to embrace that. And I fully embrace that today, but like that process was pretty challenging. Like I'm pretty stubborn. I'm a Taurus, so I have like this like, no, I'm right, no, I'm right. You know, I'm always fighting myself in that. And um, I embraced it in a way because once I actually started meeting the grandmothers and actually sitting with them and listening and just listening, it, the, the power of how much I was actually taking in and being able to grow from it was very evident when I actually look at footage from like, 2009 and like actually watch the transition of like even the style even the approach and even taking time and um, learning about the power of relationships fundamentally is the most important thing when making a film and the relationships that you have not just with who you're filming and the people around them but also your crew and your production team and Rob Reiner said this once and I always bring this up because I, I heard this panel discussion and it really like really meant a lot to me was that you know he said that the the reason why I don't scream on set is because at the end of the day, the movie isn't really for you. It's for everybody else. But the process in making it, that is your life and lived experience. You're away from your family. You're away from your friends. You're going to, like, why not create the most amazing experience for everybody collectively? It's not just about, let's get this done. Let's make sure this is perfect because of the end result. It's actually that whole process in itself is your journey, is what you will remember, what you will take away. The film is the treat for everybody else. And, and so I've really embodied that and really reflected on that. Um, and when I think back on the apology, I think that that's, that's the most important thing is, is that. And I continue to learn and for my next projects and the projects afterwards. So I'm excited. And uh, yeah, excited to be a student for life. <laughs> Thank you. And right there. Oh, me. OK. There. Uh, thank you very much for all the discussion points and all the comments regarding all of this. Um, this is a bit of a personal question for me, and I've asked like wherever I can find an audience to ask. But it's more about when, I guess this is for everyone, um, but when you first decided to enter this whole storytelling world, whether through animation, whether through like um, traditional filmmaking documentary, um, did your fam immediate family ever supported you while you entered it? And I guess somewhat of a related question is how have your perception of like community of whether it be artists or support group changed over the years since you started your career because this is something I find I have to deal with a lot personally because of the fact that um, per my personal family because they don't see the arts as like an important um, industry to go into because it falls under the whole um, model minority um, industries of like medicine law business and and all that jazz, they sometimes don't understand it. And I find I had to deal with a lot of the ignorances uh, at home while I'm trying to make it and make push myself out there and go down this path. But it's not an easy path for me. So this is why I like to ask this question to all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's really important because I think that's still something that was, it's very evident, like in film school, I was, I think I was one of four East Asian people. And, you know, and 
I'm I I'm very very lucky that you know my my family did support me and I th actually think that part of my fight to be in film and to tell stories is that I think those were dreams of my mother and my father they were both storytellers actors you know writers and they never got the opportunity to do that and so I feel like there's a bit of that that like I'm doing something that they've always wanted to do and and I have the opportunity, so don't fail, Tiffany. <laughs> no, that's, that's a joke. That's a joke. It's great, mom. Um, <laughs> but but, and I'm also really lucky that I'm a middle child, and my brother decided to go the like the conventional route of like being a lawyer. So I'm like safeguarded in some ways. Um, but but I think that the most important thing was actually having those conversations very early on with my parents around what I what. What I was, what I felt like was my calling and was my passion, and to share that with them, and and they very quickly was very supportive of that, and I'm very lucky, and I thank you, mom. Yeah, I had, uh, I had, I mean, I'm. I've been really lucky too in that um, my father, who's in the audience today, he is a uh, artist himself, a painter, um, an arts professor in China, and um, and my mom and him have always been really supportive of me uh, pursuing anything as long as I like worked really really hard and I was the best <laughs> at it. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I had a lot of friends, like a lot of um, Asian Canadian friends, like in animation school who have had a similar experience as you um, where their their parents were like not as convinced and it just took just talking to them uh, just sitting down and just like kind of like telling them about what the industry is if it's animation like talking to them about that maybe showing them box office numbers <laughs> helps too I, I know a person that did a PowerPoint <laughs> And that seemed to have worked <laughs> uh, for, for his parents. Um, but I think a lot of it is just like ignorance and they don't really know um, what it is. Uh, I mean, it's, it's risky, but a lot of industries are really risky too, but the rewards are also pretty huge as well. And I think it just takes that communication and just talking to them uh, in order to kind of, at, at least just to kind of explain a little bit more about what you're interested in. Um, and then, uh, Can I just say something? I think it's like there just needs to be more of us. Yeah. And there needs to be more examples. And I think right. that's what parents and our relatives, I'm mainly speaking to my relatives because they have no idea what I do. Right. It's like they just need to have examples to see. And like, so I always say Ang Lee. I say, I always say Ang Lee. Like, there's like, a, you know, there's some, there's like an example of like, this is possible, this can happen. You know what I mean? And I feel like, and I'm so grateful that this panel was created because this is an example. Like this can be, we just need more of it, right? Yeah, I think just, just the, the demystifying what it is uh, with facts. Like this is how much, um, <laughs> oh my God, this is terrible. <laughs> this, how, this is how much you could potentially make as uh, like a working, know, true. working cinematographer in the film industry in Toronto versus yes. we uh, have Atlanta. Unions, we have healthcare. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, de demystifying it. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> but also, just platforms like this is is very um, it's, it's very useful because it, it makes us visible and um, it's interesting because like making a, a feature film, like a micro budget feature film, with very little support was profoundly hard. It was very hard, and I, I was really happy with myself after. So were my friends, but then my parents were like, "Oh, okay," like you know. But <laughs> it's like you know, you're doing this talk, you're doing this talk at TIFF. You know, there's a review of your film in the paper, and so it, it's interesting, kind of what those things that speak to them are, um, that give validation to. So I feel like it's it's finding the right way of communicating to them and also demystifying the process. Domi, did you finish your thought? Oh, I had forgotten the, the second part of the question, but I, rem I remember now it's about the community and the support group that you yeah. th that you build around you. I think that's really important to, mm -hmm. to like have that uh, if your family isn't c completely on board at first. I think they're like really, really important, especially for your growth too, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, film school, just um, just having that community of people so that you're not alone in doing it, because it's 
it's a very creating things is a very solitary thing, right? It's you and your mind, basically, right? Ugh. <laughs> so <laughs> having like asking for help from other people, just emotional support or just I don't know um, practical support with you know feedback. Feedback. Well. feedback, yeah. I think it's just really important. Just don't be afraid to kind of engage in conversations. And it is true. Like having community is like the way to to be able to forge for, forge forward. Yeah. Especially when you're dealing with difficulties within the family dynamic, I do think that's important. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Hi, I um, have two hands up here. Oh, and I heard, heard a voice. I already have a mic here. <laughs> I, uh, thanks to all of the artists uh, for amazing works. Uh, I have a question for Tiffany. Um, I was wondering if these grandmothers, so you work with grandmothers from three different countries, and I was wondering if they interact with each other on any level, if they're aware of what they're um, going through, because I personally have been trying to uh, keep up with the, uh, the agreement between Japanese government and Korean government, and uh, it seems to me that it's become an issue of geopolitical matter rather than seeking actual reconciliation with the victims. And I, I'm just wondering if there is any attempt on any level to try to bring these grandmas together mm. to have a unified voice. I mean, very early on, I wanted to, them to all meet with each other. And it was very clear travel was not possible for them to actually get to one another. So. You don't see it in the film, but um, you see it on our Facebook. There's a lot of clips of me bringing, actually in the film there is, um, I bring the, my laptop a lot with technology. It's amazing that I could share the grandmother's messages to each other. So we had Grandma Gil send a message to Grandma Adela in the Philippines, inviting her to come to Korea and to sit and, and rally together. And in the film you see, I, uh, I am ruining it, but, a little bit. But in the film, you do see that invitation was given to Adela, and she was really excited because she had just come out to her to her kids. And, um, but before she could make it, she passed away. Um, but that invitation was extended. And so Grandma Chow also have seen video footage and images of Grandma Gill as well as Grandma Adela. And I was able to do that digitally. Um, but in terms of rallying together, there has been um, these big uh, tribunals in held in Korea, South Korea as well as in Japan where they bring and invite all these grandmothers from various parts of Asia to come together to testify and to talk about what they had gone through. But like you said, you know, at the end of the day, it's very geopol geopolitical where they're not actually listening to the grandmothers. I mean, it's not very different than what's actually happening today right now in the US. Like, I can't, I'm, I'm slightly distraught with what's happening down there and uh, Christine's testimony that was so impactful, but really it's not what she's saying. It's all politics and everyone is making this into a, you know an extreme partisan fight that is not actually about what this woman had just said. And so I think there's still a lot of learning that needs to happen and a change in system and protocols. Um, but the fact that more people are coming out and telling their stories is, is the first big step, which I'm really proud of. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Over there. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if any of you had to navigate sort of complicated or difficult community dynamics in the work that you did? And if so, if you could reflect a little bit on what it means for you as Asian Canadian storytellers, like what the sort of the politics or the stakes are of being Asian Canadian storytellers telling the stories of Asian Canadian communities. Yeah, uh, for, for us, um, it was tricky because like, you know, like there aren't a lot of examples of Asian Canadians on the big screen. So anytime you do see one on screen, like um, they, they have they um, they represent a lot. Like they they uh, they have to like uh, basically represent a whole people, and you and it's really difficult to tell a specific story about you know a specific character going through this relationship with her son. Um, and uh, try to also be inclusive of like a huge population of the world that has like different experiences and nuances. And I think like when we were uh, working on Bao, 
um, we were really c- conscious of that. Um, and that's why for me it was important to show the story reels um, to like cultural groups uh, within the studio um, just to make sure that, you know, we I was representing us, right? Um, and anytime there were kind of comments or like notes, like maybe a couple times we got like just questions about like the design choices of the characters, the eyes. Um, I it, like I would put it upon my sp- myself to like talk with them, to like meet with them, and say like thank you so much for for your notes, um, and then explain to them like my thoughts behind it, um, my insp- my artistic inspirations, um, my intention, and uh, hopefully like work together in order to uh, make the the short uh, as um, uh, just as successful as possible. <laughs> Thank you. I think this goes back to that um, that question about stereotypes. Um, so with kind of stereotypes, it kind of creates kind of just this very narrow definition of what Asian is, right? And in reality, there's all different types of view, point of views um, in that in this cultural group, right? And so I, I think one of the difficulties is sometimes um, you're kind of just asked to be the mouthpiece of this whole kind of um, broad um, group of people that have so many different stories, so many different points of view, so many different personalities. Um, but in, in reality, you're only kind of telling kind of your segment and your um, your your very sp- specific story and so I think um, more work needs to be made so that um, it can be shown that you know it, we're not kind of a unidimensional caricature stereotype like yada 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 there's so many um, stories within um, kind of this Asian Canadian Asian American identity um, and yeah so that that is my answer. <laughs> Great answer. Thank you. I mean, with documentary, we're the capturing of and what you show and what you choose to show. I think there was a maybe there's this one point where maybe the thought of like people not understanding like why a daughter is screaming at her mother and like oh is she abusing her like why is she always screaming she can't hear it was it was very we had to make that very clear right off the bat she just can't hear and she refused many times of hearing aid, right? But she just couldn't hear, so everyone's just screaming at her. And and why she lives alone, how could you, like, this, like who, who your audience is as well, it's like, you know, you have North American audience viewing this film and certain cultural things that they don't understand, so there's that judgment of like, okay, well, how are they going to understand that and how are you going to, to treat that and like, how is it gonna look like? And so in many ways, like you said, it's like if there was actually just more of that, you don't have to be so specific into having to explain every little thing. Mm-hmm. But it was it was a concern. It's like how different audiences have a different relationship. Mm-hmm. And I actually, I found it really great when playing the clip that we showed that people were laughing at Grandma Chow mm-hmm. saying, oh my God, why am I not dead yet? I can't die. <laughs> But like in Sweden, like nobody laughs. <laughs> and it was like, so you see the different dynamics, like, oh, this is like, how, how could you say that? Oh my goodness. So it's, it's understanding like, you know, there's different audiences that see the things. And may, sometimes for me, it's like, you know, you make the film, you do the story and let it out there. Um, you can't hold everyone's hand through it. And sometimes you just have to be bold with just having that out there. Beautiful, thank you. I think we have time for one more question right there with the mic. My question is, when I started, there was three international Asian students at Sheridan, two local. So there's five amongst 300 people in media arts. That's, a, that's not a lot. This is, we're talking about 2006, 2007. Oh, it's like opposite now. <laughs> exactly. So that's the thing. So when you, when you gals first started, um, when you guys went to school, what was the representation of then? And because you guys are successful now, like when you look back, what do you see the difference in terms of like a decade plus later of like how much more like Asian, American, Asian, Canadian, Asian people from the Western world are finally branching out into their artistic fields where back then it was a faux pas. You gotta be a doctor, you gotta be good at math. 
you can't, you know, you got to make that extra money because these are reputable professions that what they think is right, but what they don't know of what you guys have gone through and what successes you guys have achieved for yourselves. Can you describe to everybody here the differences of back then when you were in school to the current now? Uh, I was, I feel like when I was in school, like, um, that it was like just on that, it was in that transition uh, age. Like, cause I feel like uh, my, my school year, 2011, uh, it was at least 50, almost 50, 50 male and female in animation, which was like very different than like 10, 20 years or 20 or 30 years ago. Like animation was predominantly white male. Um, but when I went into school at Sheridan, it was, uh, yeah, it was like a lot of girls, a lot of Asian girls. I think we were all raised on like the same anime or like, the, like, like, like the same cartoons, the same manga. Uh, and we're all just like super nerdy. And we all, um, I guess we're really, we all convinced our parents that this was somehow going to be a good career choice. Um, so I feel really lucky that I was able to go to school, like surrounded by people that like kind of looked like me and felt like me. Um, and it, it was actually uh, when I went to Pixar, like when I transitioned into the actual animation industry, I was like, oh, wait, I'm I'm like a, a unicorn. <laughs> I'm actually not co uh, that that common at all. Um, so actually, I'm really grateful that I was able to kind of live, uh, uh, just uh, grow and learn uh, in a school environment where I didn't feel like an other, because I think that just almost protected me <laughs> and shielded me from uh, the, re the harsh realities of, of the world. And I kind of went into uh, the film industry like very naive, and but almost like that was almost like a, a like a plus, like I, I didn't have that in my head. So I was just operating under the um, probably false assumption that like, oh, like everything is a meritocracy. I'm just gonna keep working, work, 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 and then see what, you know, like, and then slowly climb my way to the top that way. And then after a couple of years, I was like, wait, no, every, no, that, that's not true. <laughs> everything is very different out here. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was my experience. <laughs> Yeah, when I was in film school, I think the ratio f for men to women were four to one or something like that. Like in a, in a class of like 30 every year. Back then at York, they took 30 people and it was a four to one. There, there, were, there weren't that many women. And, um, and then the women that were there, um, we were kind of um, relegated to, oh, you should do sound, you should do production design, that kind of thing, I remember. Um, yeah, like... I remember I had a classmate that told me, well, not everyone can be a director. Oh. <laughs> it was this, this guy. Um, What's he doing now? Uh, <laughs> Don't answer. Chilling. Answer. Chilling. He's <laughs> <laughs> dead. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It was, it was hard. Like, I mean, um, I think the, the, the reason why, because uh, I started off in cinematography, and so the reason why I, I went into directing was because um, even at kind of that film school level, I didn't feel like the the stories really kind of reflected my point of view, and so I wanted to kind of do something about it. Um, uh, but but yeah, so I think but but I, I don't know in like kind of trends. I think the the dominant conversation back when I was in film school was about kind of counter portrayal, um, like kind of like the Better Luck Tomorrow sort of thing, where um, like Asian men are emasculated in, in popular media. Therefore, um, we need to kind of like over masculine, like over masculine mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, and, and sometimes it's um, to the detriment of women and other people that you see on screen. So it's like, oh, let's put a super misogynistic Asian guy on screen. That will counter the, the Asian ma male, like emasculation. Um, so I, I saw a lot more of that back then than I see now. So I, I, I feel like people are, are a bit more woke. And, um, and also, I feel like now there's, there's kind of a lot of conversations about solidarity with other oppressed groups, um, like indigenous 
um, people and other people of color. And um, there wasn't as much, I mean, I'm not an academic, but it, it just didn't seem like in kind of the um, current kind of consciousness, there was as much conversation mm -hmm. then. Yeah, I think I mentioned I was one of four um, East Asian, and I think there was a total of maybe six people of color in my in the class of 60 at Ryerson. Um, and I actually, I've gone back to Ryerson to do some talks, to, and then I also snoop around just to see how things have changed. <laughs> um, not that much, not that much. I mean, it is still, it is, it was 50-50 when I was in school. Um, is there any Ryerson people here? Woo, there we go. So there's like, what, six? We're all here, it's still the same. <laughs> we're getting there, we're getting there. Um, but, <laughs> but you know what, I, like during my year at Ryerson, it was, it, was, it was an odd battle, I think, because I was faced in writing class. A lot of the kids that, were, that got into the program, they were like coming from like smaller towns um, outside of Toronto. And a lot of the writing was really problematic because there's a lot of stereotyping in the characters that they're writing and no one was speaking up, no, not the profs and no one else was saying anything that was wrong. And so I just became now known as like the angry Asian lesbian at Ryerson. Like I think there's a poster of me that says that somewhere there. Cause I would be the old, cause I'm like, how can we sit through this? Like if, if they just graduate fourth year with the scripts like this, movies will continue doing this and we have a responsibility to make some change. Here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> On that note, we will pause this conversation. Especially, I want to acknowledge the two enthusiastic hands here. Please come and talk to these beautiful people afterwards. We're going to pause our conversation and also in the world continue these conversations about change, about there needs to be more, about complexity, about terrifying loves, and that that's what makes amazing work. And it's true, I don't think everyone can be a director, and these people can, and they're amazing. So thank you for being here, thank you for the conversation that you had with us. Okay, BK, before we leave, yeah. can we do a giant selfie? We I, can do a giant selfie, okay. but before we even do that, I yeah. also want to ask um, you folks to tell us, if you haven't seen or you want to see them again, how do folks see your films? Uh, For you, they might have to go to the theater. Oh, yeah. But, uh, Incredibles 2 will be out on Blu-ray DVD uh, at some point, and then Bao will also be attached to it. You can probably find it online at some, like, bootleg, like, <laughs> Russian site or town. something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Wexford Plaza is available on iTunes, and I think there are DVDs in the TIFF gift shop. Um, yeah, I saw it. Yeah, I, I saw it on Instagram somewhere. So that it's it, it's somewhere in there. So, actually, uh, the apology is being broadcasted on uh, PBS. Uh, October twenty oh, nice. second is our uh, broadcast premiere across the U.S. I don't think that's helpful for us here, but uh, it's also available, I believe, on the NFB site as well, so you can see it there as well. Yes. Okay, now we're gonna do a giant selfie. <laughs> this is gonna be great. Oh, yeah, you guys stand there, yeah, okay. uh, yeah, and then we could do, oh, this is the, this is, be no, this is the best one, you stand there. Joyce, stand there. <laughs> this is great, this is great. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, one more, one more. Perfect, thank you. Thank you.